Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. It's, this is part of the Skubani e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Skubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. The sensation, Sriracha to go. Today we have Farbad Delamian and Kyle Lewis, co-founders of Sriracha to go. It's a company catering to the needs of Sriracha fans worldwide. They make, get this, amazing keychain to go bottles so you can carry your Sriracha sauce with you everywhere. You have to be fanatical about your sauce. They sold their initial order of 20,000 units in two weeks. We'll talk about that and how they did it. And they sold over 10,000 three packs on Groupon in a week. And that's just the beginning. And they received an investment from Mark Cuban's investment company. Kyle Farbad, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having us. Having us, Charlie. One of you in New York, one of you in California. And, you know, we're going to talk a lot of cool stuff, licensing agreements, getting Mark Cuban as an investor, the huge buzz around your product, how you launched. Um, I always like to start with the fun fact, which most people don't know about you. And fun fact, far about about you is, you were, which is unexpected, you were big into freestyle rapping and you dominated the San Diego party scene. Uh, uh, self-proclaimed dominated. Self-proclaimed dominated, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was a, uh, it was kind of a stage I went through late high school, early college, um, which, as I was mentioning earlier, I don't think Kyle even even knew. I don't even think my my girlfriend knows. But I went through a a five to ten year stage where parties, bars, whenever I'd go out, um, it was it was me freestyling uh, wow. against other people. If there was a bar or any sort of contest, I would get involved and, and usually do pretty well. Um, can't imagine I'm, I still have it nowadays. I don't think it's like riding a bike, but uh, mm -hmm. it went through a solid, solid spree there where I actually thought there might be a, a future involved in that. Did you want to be a professional rapper at the time? I mean, it was nothing that I, I thought that I was ever that, okay. that provision in, but I, I, I love doing it. I always thought it'd be great, great fun to go up there with some of the the rappers that I love and the hip hop artists that like, I'd have these visions of like freestyling with them on stage, but. I, I well, when you're was... huge, Thrush to Go is huge. You'll be able to freestyle with whoever you want. So, yeah, hopefully. and hopefully, I'm hoping you could find a clip of this. And everyone who watches to the end of this may or may not, we'll see, can see Farbod actually rapping freestyle. Yeah, right? like I'm not going to promise it, but yeah, I can't, yeah. I can't commit to that. But I'll, I'll definitely, <laughs> I'll, I'll search through my Dropbox. And um, Kyle, for you, um, as a kid, you like to slick your hair back. Yeah. Tell so, me the story behind that. Yeah. So this is especially funny ever since Sriracha to Go launched. My family loves uh, bringing this up. When I was a kid, and uh, most most of the time it happened when I was in the pool, uh, I would go underwater and I'd come up out of the water and I'd slick my hair back and I would like to say, um, I'm a businessman. <laughs> and I used to, when I was younger, I used to have a, a pretty bad lisp. Hmm. So that didn't come out very well. Um, and my, my family still to this day loves teasing me about that. So how'd you get rid of your lisp? I don't know. Uh, just went away I naturally? Think, I, I think people tease, not tease, but playful teasing and, um, it uh, eventually went away. Yeah, it's interesting because childhood and growing up is hard enough, let alone having something else going on. Was it, was there ever kind of, um, a confidence because you seem pretty confident in general. It, it, I may be over-exaggerating the list, but I don't think that it was ever that bad. It wasn't that bad, uh, okay. No, it wasn't like a um, speech impediment that I went to, to classes for or anything like that. Yeah. Um, it was just something that close friends would would give me a hard time about. Yeah. So let's start from the beginning of the journey, and I want to find out what works with boosting sales. You guys have hit it out of the park early on and some mistakes to avoid, but how would you guys meet? Um, so we met in San Francisco in 2000. I always get the year wrong, Kyle. 2011. 11. Um, at a company by the name of Extol. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, 
um, a startup based in San Francisco, and Kyle started a few months after I did. Mm -hmm. uh, we were both on the sales team, and um, hit it off pretty quickly, so we became, we became pretty good friends, and soon after that, I actually moved out to New York um, to kind of be part of the um, heading up of the New York sales team and the New York team mm -hmm. for Excel here in the city. Um, so I made that transition, and I moved on from Extol I, about a year after that, and then Kyle actually then moved to New York to take that position, and we ended up living together. Oh, so wow. um, it worked out really well, and and you know I didn't really know anyone when I moved out here. I don't think he knew anyone. So when he moved out here, it, it was a really good good situation. So what did you guys learn working at Extol, a startup? A lot. Uh, you know, it's it's something that I highly recommend to a lot of people because um, you have um, just from working at a startup, you you get insight and visibility into a lot more than you would um, at a company like Oracle, which I've also uh, have firsthand experience with. Right. Um, you just you you get to see a little bit more um, of a sliver of how things are actually done in a business, and you have more input. Um, you could help, you know, build uh, things like sales strategy, marketing strategy, things of that nature. Um, and you also you also learn what doesn't work, what you know yeah. how how not to do things. Yeah. What you what did you see that wasn't working that you you thought I'm we're not going to do this in my future company? Over hiring, over hiring, I think was like for me personally, and and I think I won't speak for Kyle, but I think a big part of that for him as well, where. You know, you have some success, and you know, you always get. You know, there's pressure from the board to hit some numbers, mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, I've been at a few startups, and I've noticed not all of them, um, but there are definitely a lot out there that that overhire, and then they have to scale back, and then that's going to lead the layoffs, and then that leads to morale issues, mm -hmm. leads to people leaving, um, and then it's really hard to come back from that. So I, I get wanting to grow fast and, and just hit it out of the park, but you know, once the layoffs start, people are you know looking over their shoulder and always worried about their job, and that that kind of that there's there's a sense of people being scared, and and sometimes that works in the benefit, but it it also leads to a lot of people looking for work. Right. Instead of working on what they're doing, they're looking at uh, career builder or something. Yeah. We saw that firsthand. I don't know. I, I, th I think that that's a big one that yeah. I saw in terms of things that that I learned yeah. that we, we definitely didn't want to adapt. Yeah, because startups are you know they're figuring it out too. What else did you see that you learned from that we're going to do things differently? Yeah, it kind of goes hand in hand with what Farbot had mentioned, but um, spending in general. Mm -hmm. Is something, especially when you think about uh, venture back startups here in the, the Silicon Valley, um, you know, immediately when when a company gets around to funding, they they need to hit certain growth metrics to be able to get that next round. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like you're to six a cycle. Exactly, you're addicted to this to this funding, and if you don't get that next round, the company's gone. Um, so as a result. The you know the leaders of that company decide to to invest all this money in sales teams, and I think that's where what Farbot was mentioning people end up over hiring and they kind of go overboard. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think that we took that um, like the general principle of not spending money frugally, mm -hmm. or sorry, not overspending, yeah. um, and just making sure that we're growing at a at a sustainable rate. Uh, we're not you know, spending a lot of money that we don't have. We're not, um, you know, doing things that are unrealistic. And so we always want to make sure that, you know, we're making profit on every transaction and, and things that we're, the way that we're building the business and the foundation of the business is still, you know, uh, leads to sustainable growth and allows us to, to grow over time. Yeah. So that deter you from at the time, did you think, well, we don't want to have to take funding someday because of that? Or were you somewhere in the middle? Yeah, it's definitely a consideration. I think anytime you take funding, I mean, obviously you you got an investment from from someone else. So what was the consideration whether you were going to take it or, or just keep going without it? Yeah, Farbod Farbod and I talked a lot about that, and it was a you know 
the the due diligence process with the the Mark Cuban company's team was a a span of a few months, and throughout that entire period, Farbot and I, you know, we we talked through a lot of scenarios, and uh, we we looked at it from every angle that we could. Um, we ended up doing it because you know we we weren't going to use the money to go hire people that um, you need to continue paying to keep on payroll. Right. We're, we're going to use the money to uh, invest in new products. Fulfill need, yeah. Right, exactly. And and those new products are going to generate a profit. And yeah. then that will allow us to mm-hmm. come out with, with other products. Um, so the, the, you know, the money helps fuel growth. It doesn't help us uh, create a growth that's not sustainable, mm-hmm. create expenses that may not be sustainable. Yeah. So Farba, what did you see in Extol that you liked? You're like, I want to do things like this in my company when I found it. Um, you know, a, a lot of things, a lot of things. I think both at Extol, um, you know, Commerce Social and NewsCred, the three, the three startups that I've been a part of, there were a lot of, a lot of positive things. And Extol was my first exposure to the startup world. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was very new to me just in terms of the culture and the cohesiveness and the way people work together, you know, the product team, the sales team, legal, marketing, it was really one team and there, you know, there, there's disconnect no matter where you are, but the level of disconnect was a lot less and people were actually very good at communicating with each other and you knew what was on the product roadmap. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if, if you had a, a contract that you got from a client that had some red lines, you were a part of talking to the lawyer and, and getting getting that expedited. And mm-hmm. I just really liked that everyone from the CEO um, down to the sales team, you know, and everyone in between was, you know, sat together. There was, you know, there were no cubes, there were no offices. Um, it's not like our CEO had his own office. He was there grinding with us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, working 12. It's like a flat structure. So everyone, you know, and you know, news cred, the last company I was at did an incredible job of that as well. The culture element, keeping people excited. Um, and everyone had the same vision and mindset was, Mm -hmm. was big. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you know, that, that, that goes a long way when everyone's bought in, um, obviously things change and you find another job or whatnot. That's nothing against the company you were at prior. Everyone you know, who was bought in at Extol had the same vision. And you know, when we end up expanding our team, we definitely want those type of people, um, people who are in it, in it to win it and, and really get our story and get where we're going and want to be mm-hmm. part of it. That's, that's the thing with startups. Everyone's hungry and, and gets, gets that. Right. And that vision, when you say that, what pops into my head, Farbad, is the YouTube commercial. Yeah. For some reason. Tell me about how you came up with that. And for people who don't know, they can check out these YouTube commercial. I don't want to spoil it, but um, there's a, a nice looking lady that comes by with a guy eating his, uh, I think it's a sandwich of some sort. And there's, he's got a puppy dog there. So what was the, how'd you come up with the idea for that? as the vision for that commercial? We went through so many different scenarios for a video. I remember there was a night when Kyle and I literally were, were at the apartment with a whiteboard and we were just jotting down different ideas and we were doing that for like six hours and it, it progressed into that. I mean, our, our initial idea was completely different um, and then we thought- yeah. What, what did it a- start off as and then tell people how it ended up? Yeah, so it started off as um, it was a restaurant scene. I, I hope I, I hope we don't end up shooting this video one day where I'm giving it away. But um, it was a restaurant scene in which uh, it was something in effect of there was a, a guy out with a girl to dinner, and um, the, the the girl asked for sriracha. So they're at a fancy like Michelin star restaurant. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've all actually, us who love our sriracha, have moments where we're at a Michelin star restaurant. Uh, it's kind of, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be thinking this, but it'd be nice to have sriracha even with this, you know, with this foie gras. Um, right, right. The chef comes out and like kicks you out of the place. Yeah, so. it was kind of that. So it was, you know, the, the, the girl asked for the sriracha, the waiter, it was like a French restaurant, um, you know, kind of like rolls his eyes and says, no, we don't have sriracha here. Um, and it was, it was to the effect of either she 
there were a couple scenarios, but I think the initial one was she she pretty much just flipped out at her boyfriend because she was like, did you bring the sriracha? And he's like, I'm tired of lugging around a big bottle of sriracha. Mm-hmm. Go for you. And she just flips out, flips the table over, um, you know, like pushes the waiter and it's kind of like slow motion. It, it's what we envisioned it. And then she sees this guy sitting alone with his sriracha to go, using it on his steak or whatnot. Mm. Um, and she like goes and starts eating with him and starts feeding him and the boyfriend stuck alone. So okay. that was the, we thought that would have been an incredible video as well. But I think that that would have taken a much larger budget mm-hmm. to do something that extreme with renting a restaurant and, and throwing plates and breaking – so, you know, breaking plates and, and all that. We would have probably had to have a lot more actors as well. Yeah. And so then what you ended up going with? Yeah, we thought that was a fun, simple, you know, you've got the puppy, which is, you know, it was one of the cutest puppies we ever, we've ever seen in, in real life. And I think in the video, you could, you could see that as well. Um, we had a beautiful girl who <laughs> saw Racha um, and saw the puppy and, you know, you don't you don't know what grass for eye first, um, and then there's the guy who's just eating the burrito and loving it, um, and that poor Jason had probably went through what Kyle six burritos that day. Are you serious? Because <laughs> we were shoot, we had to keep shooting it and keep shooting it. Um, <laughs> poor guy, but yeah, I mean, it was just a little bit of everything: great food, a puppy, sriracha, a beautiful mm. woman, a good-looking guy. Um, who she, you know, who she gave no attention to, and we thought that was a perfect thirty-second clip and right. simple, and, and yeah. got the point across. I ask that because you got your mind thinks a little bit differently. We'll talk about what led up to the idea of this product, because which I would never have thought of, and probably most people would agree. Um, but how your marketing works, and same, you know, similar like Dollar Shave Club, they had like this really cool video. Same thing with you coming up with these innovative ideas to kind of spread the word. Did that require a big budget? Um, again, back to Kyle, you know, what Kyle had said and I mentioned earlier, like we're, we're, we learned this in the startup world, expenses, costs. We, yeah. we were very conscious of that stuff. So, you know, we leverage our network. And Kyle has a friend who's based in Los Angeles who is in that world. Mm-hmm. Um, and we leverage them and we're able to do it at a, at a probably a, a third or a quarter of the price. Yeah. Where, yeah. Whereas if we were to go to like th- through a digital studio or whatnot uh, agency and have it done that way yeah. yeah so what led to the idea tell me leading up to the idea of actually coming up with this particular product yeah so so like farbot had mentioned earlier uh we were roommates in new york and um we are also big foodies and so farbot and i you know probably our biggest hobby especially in new york was to go out and eat mm-hmm. and um so while we were out at those meals, we kept finding ourselves in a situation where we wanted sriracha. And uh, it wasn't available, and still isn't today, isn't available at restaurants. They, most of the time, if they have anything, they have Tabasco, they have ketchup, they have mustard, salt, pepper, kind of the standards. Right. Um, but they rarely have sriracha. And so it, it became a running joke between Farbot and I that it would be really great to have sriracha at this meal. And we just kept mentioning it and didn't, didn't do anything about it because we didn't want to lug, you know, what, what were we going to do? Lug an entire bottle to the restaurant. Um, so it just became a running joke. And uh, one day we ended up getting food to go. We were out in New York. We had had a couple of drinks. Um, late night, wanted to get some pizza. And instead of eating it at the, the pizza restaurant, we decided to get it to go so that we could bring it home and eat it with sriracha Mm -hmm. and uh, on our way home a a rainstorm came out came out of nowhere and uh, the pizza box was was soaked by the time we got home we were both soaked and uh, we when we got home Farbot actually pulled up his computer and you know uh, in such anger of this situation and and looked for a uh, looked for a miniature sriracha bottle he's like there's got to be something out there Mm where we could just bring it with us and there wasn't. Um, so then we kind of got addicted to the idea and we, we were doing, you know, research day and night. Um, and there were, there are many bottles like travel size airplane bottles out there that you can fill with whatever you want. Um, but 
you know, they don't have, a lot of them aren't food grade, you know, they're for things like hand sanitizer and whatnot. Um, so we just, it, it kind of snowballed from there and we kept, we kept thinking about the idea and, and Farbot and I are, are very, um, we have very business yeah. focused minds. So we, we, we love debating on what's a good business, what's a bad business, you know, what are the, what are the, you know, how, how can we poke holes in this? And so we were doing that for, for maybe a month yeah. and we couldn't poke a hole in the idea and we just, we were like, let's, we should give this a shot. There's no compelling reason why not to do this. Um, and so we just, we just kept moving forward. Yeah. So what would, what'd you do next? So you decide, okay, what was the first, was that the first iteration of the idea or was there something before what we see now? There, there have been s- s- updates. Uh, for instance, uh, what we're going to talk about later, the Hoi Fong uh, partnership. We were now using their artwork, things like that. Um, so it's an official Hoi Fong licensed product. Yeah. But uh, for the most part, it's, it is very similar. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the next steps after, after that research phase was um, to, to put together essentially a, a business plan, a, yeah. a simplified business plan, and think about, okay, how... You know, how much is it going to cost to get the product? How can we customize it? How can we make the mold? How can we shape it in the right way? How can we get it the right, you know, uh, food safe plastic, BPA free, all that stuff? Um, and how much is that going to cost? And, you know, what realistically, what can we sell this thing for? Um, and we just continued down that road and we started talking to manufacturers, both uh, in the United States and in China, and figuring out, you know, how much it's going to cost to get it off the ground. and. Um, cost of goods sold and all that good stuff, which, you know, for Farbot and I was, was a completely new world. Right. Uh, you know, before that we had careers in, in software sales. So, right. um, you know, selling a, a physical product and actually building a product, a tangible physical product was totally new to us. Yeah. Um, so it was a, it was a steep learning curve. Um, you know, the, the entire manufacturing world was new to us. Um, but we just, you know, we did a lot of research. We kept, we had a lot of conversations with, you know, friends that were in the industry. Yeah. And, tell me about some of what advice were you getting, Kyle and Farwa? Tell me some advice also that, that you were getting. You were probably getting, talking to different people and, and kind of getting some mentors. Yeah. I mean, at that point, you know, it was, for, for example, there was, there was a, a buddy of mine who I worked with at the time. Um, it was, I think, September of 2013. So around when we, a little bit after when we actually thought of the idea and were in conversations with manufacturers. Um, so about a year before we actually launched, uh, a buddy of mine, he has a product um, on that he sells on Amazon called Cat Amazing, and. Um, he had been selling that for about a year or two and, and, you know, it was a side gig and he was doing well with it. So he, he was one of the initial people we went to for just like basic advice, manufacturing advice, things like that. Right. He was a huge help to us. Yeah. Um, but I remember specifically September, it, it might have even been August, but Kyle and I were like, all right, how are we going to get this launched and, and out before Christmas? Yeah. Uh, and I'll never forget when I told Kyle this. We, we were both so discouraged, but Andre said, he's like, man, I'll be surprised if you get this launched by next Christmas. Wow. Um, and that was interesting because we're, you know, in our minds at the time, like this is just a, a empty plastic bottle. We're going to get the design. Right. But there's so much more to it um, that really, you know, as to this day, we're learning how much more there is to one product uh, than, than just creating it and launching it. So, you know, we were so naive to that and talking to guys like Andre um, and just other people in the industry. You know, we, we have friends who are advisors at, um, at software companies but have done stuff in the e-commerce space who right. we're talking to. Um, there were a couple other, like, um, solutions. Kyle, I always forget the name of it in which we would call and we, we could request uh, 30 minutes time or 10 minutes time with specific advisors. And, and that helped us a lot as we were launching as well. Um, but early Clarity. on, you know, yeah, it's actually, it's called Clarity, which is actually another Mark Cuban company. Um, but yeah, I think to, yeah. to kind of piggyback on what Farbot mentioned, I think I I think that's one of the uh, best skills you can have as an entrepreneur is being willing uh, to network and and 
ask people for favors yeah. and ask them for advice. And I think um, what you'll find most often is that people are, are really willing to give advice. Yeah. Um, people who have been through it before, they get it, they understand. Um, and so I think that, you know, that was great for us. Like Farbod was, was rattling off, you know, there have been a variety of people in a variety of different industries, whether it be legal, accounting, manufacturing, who have, yeah. uh, who have helped us a lot. From the manufacturing end of things, what um, was some good advice you got that helped you avoid some, some big pitfalls or mistakes on that end? Uh, well, a, lo- a lot of the, the mistakes we learned the hard way. Um, like what? So we, we found our first um, manufacturer through Alibaba, um, which we thought, you know, we had, we had heard good things about Alibaba, big, you know, big company doing very well. Um, you know, this would be a good place to start. And it, it was, you know, we, we, had, we were in conversations with a variety of manufacturers and we were getting samples made and, and things of that nature. Um, but what we learned and what we now know is that um, there's, there's not a very um, – some of the people that you find on The Alibaba reputation, not, it's hard to right, sift out not, who the best reputation of, of like trustworthy manufacturers are there. Exactly. There's, it's hard to trust those people. We didn't know that at, at first. Um, and some are good. I don't want to talk you know, in blanket statements. Some I'm sure are good. Um, but it's hard to it, kind of figure out which ones exactly which. And, and, went from the other side of the world you can't easily go meet them and go check out their facility it makes it uh, extra tricky yeah and they're the lifeblood of the of the company they're you know they are building the product and that's right. a that's an extremely important part of of the business and you know spe- on top of that the language barrier and fit in the time difference like it, it makes it very difficult to get business done um, and so now what, you know, what we would suggest to anybody who's now in that situation would be um, to do, do everything that you can to find a connection. So now the distributor that we're working with is actually uh, through a family connection of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is a level of trust. Farbot and I actually went to, to China earlier this year and met with them and sat down with them and, and had dinner with them. And um, so it's... And that helped quite a bit as well. We we highly recommend that too. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely a learning process, and it's it's hard to hard to find a manufacturer that that you can really trust. Yeah. What was interesting when you went to China and you probably toured the facilities? What was interesting about the manufacturing process that you wouldn't have known without going on site? I think something that comes to mind how manual a lot of this stuff is. Um, you know, there's you go and there's a table of people working on your product, which is which is just crazy to see people manually putting the caps on or right. things like that. You know, it's, you picture like some machine coming down and just like snapping them on type yeah, of thing. It was machine based, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a lot of that stuff can't be done via machine. So um, that was interesting. We were delighted to see how clean and well put together our facility was you know we, we actually saw a few other facilities as we were driving by and um just like peeking our heads in and so forth this was like top notch and it was very good working conditions and so forth um so i think we were both really really happy with that just because you hear horror you never know whether it's you know bangladesh or china or wherever it may be you hear stuff mm-hmm. and we were scared about that because we want to be conscious of that as well um so that that was good to see, uh, and you know, just the way they, outside of the, the facility, the way they treat you there is is great. Like going out with them and, and the experience we had was was something I, I think Kyle and I will never forget in terms of um, doing the dinners with them and the amount of wine they make you drink and and things like that. It was it was that night that we went to dinner. With the, the whole facility and the, the the management and the owners was one of the most memorable nights. Really? Wow, that's amazing. What was the what's, what was the hardest part initially before you launched it to the public? What was the hardest um, part about getting to that point? I I would say that the hardest part was um, uh, time management and. Moving, moving forward. You're both and, doing full-time jobs at this point, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. We, we both have full-time jobs that were um, very time-intensive jobs. We, Farbot and I traveled a lot for work. Um, and we, we were working on this on the side mm -hmm. and we were still, you know, there was a lot of work that went into it before we ever made a dollar. Yeah. And so it was kind of, sometimes it was difficult to, to stay motivated because we didn't, we didn't know if this thing would even do well. Right. right. I mean, we, we thought it would cause we would buy it. Um, but you have no idea until you get it out there. But, yeah. Right. It could have, I mean, it could have flopped. It could have knocked on anywhere. Um, and so sometimes it was hard to, to just stay motivated and to, to, you know, when we get home after a long day to, to do more research and reading and, you know, emails back and forth with China, uh, which are not always fun. Um, so I think just kind of keeping, keeping our eye on the, the goal, which was to launch this thing, um, got us through kind of that, that 18 months of, of product development. Yeah. So those crazy days, what did the day look like? You get back, how late were you working in the evening? I mean, I, I think the craziest days were, you know, leading up to the launch. Yeah, it was crazy, but it wasn't. You know, let's say we get a, we were working eight to seven or eight to six or eight to eight, whatever that that regular work day at Newscred and um, at Oracle for Kyle mm -hmm. consisted of. You know, when we got home, we put in a few hours, so it was it wasn't like we were up till three four a.m. leading up to the launch. Right. When we launched, it was a whole different level. And it was the most insane month of I think our lives where we would go to work, um, and then we'd be up packing boxes and dealing with stuff till till four. Yeah, I mean it was consistently till till three, four, five. I know there was a few four, five o'clock nights, and then get up and go to um, go to our other jobs yeah. at the time, our real jobs um, at eight o'clock, and then do that again. So it was, I mean, it was twenty hour days. Right. Launch. Prior to that, it was. You know, it was manageable. It was it was right. fifteen, eighteen hours. And yeah, we weren't getting much sleep. It's like startup manageable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then you know, in, in the midst of all that, when we launched, which we'll probably talk through a little more later, there yeah. was all the conversations with China, where you know, Kyle and I would would put our alarms, set our alarms to check the emails in the middle of the night, um, and try to get on conversations, get conversations going with China, so that we wouldn't miss them the next day, and then we'd have to wait another twelve hours to hear right. back. So. So there's a lot of that. Yeah. Um, so tell me about the launch, but before, so you do you get tens of thousands of units delivered to your apartment? Like where did the where do you have them delivered? Yeah, they were in, uh, a, they were in a New York City apartment. It, it was it was a mess. I mean, what did that look That's, like? I mean, you have like one of your bedrooms like half full with. Wait, I, have, I so I have a funny story about this. We, um, yeah, you're right. So so. When you get it imported, it, it arrived at the the New York the, the New Jersey docks, and uh, you have a truck go pick it up and deliver it. And as part of the, uh, when you're filling out some of that paperwork, they ask you, do you have a loading dock? And Farber and I didn't know how to, I really had to answer that question. We weren't sure, you know, if we say no, are they not going to deliver this? So right. um, I think we just said yes, we do. And um, just so that we could get the, the truck there and we'll, we'll kind of ask for forgiveness later. And um, the truck arrived um, and, you know, we were, we live in a residential area in East Village and in, in New York. And um, there's only room for really one car, let alone truck uh, right. on the streets. And so the truck came, I got a call, um, I go downstairs and there's already cars backed up for the anniversary back to the intersection and people are honking. And I was like, I was like, what are we going to do? And the, the truck driver was like, we're just going to, we're going to make them wait. And so it took probably 10 minutes, people honking, people getting out of their cars. Uh, I'll never forget that. And we just stacked up the boxes on the sidewalk and, um, you know, it took about an hour to get them all in, but then the truck driver took off and, Truck driver was only there for like ten minutes, but the rest. It of the seemed like an eternity. With I mean, you people getting out of their cars, swearing at you. Kyle, probably. Kyle was on his own. I was traveling for news cred at the time, so I he was just so low, and he, he needed like street cred rapper to be there, like <laughs> fending the, fending the people off. <laughs> but he handled it. So and so yeah, so, yeah how yeah. many boxes are we talking? Like how many boxes did they unload? Ten big boxes, so you can imagine, you know, ten big boxes in a in a Manhattan apartment um, is no joke. So it's not like we have a garage or a storage area. 
Right. So it's, right. it's in our living room. It was in the corner of our living room. Um, well, yeah, more than just a corner, but you know, it, it was it was kind of a mess, and it was it was something that we were hoping would only be there for a few months yeah. till yeah. maybe four, five, six months, and then the next order would be our our big order where we would potentially have a fulfillment yeah. center and, and have them shipped out of there. Yeah, I mean, this is a big risk at this point, right? I mean. You, what was your strategy? And we'll, we'll talk about what ended up happening. But what was your strategy when we get these things? How, how are you planning on selling them? Yeah, so the, 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 we had a whole marketing plan built out. And, and Farbert and I were funding this from our, our savings account at the, uh, accounts at the time. So mm-hmm. it's not like we had a big budget to go you know, buy a bunch of ads and billboards and whatnot. So it was um, very much like a grassroots marketing organic approach. Um, and so we had kind of a, a two-phase launch plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first phase of which was uh, friends and family. Basically, we would we would open up the website, we would turn on Facebook, turn on Twitter, you know, make all those accounts public, mm-hmm. and basically announce this thing. Put a bunch of good pictures out on the on the internet and these social properties, and kind of hope that that people pick it up and. Um, friends and family share it on on their Facebook pages, and mm-hmm. um, you know, see how far we could take that. Um, and then the second phase of that launch was going to be a, a publisher outreach. Um, we had already reached out to a few publishers, and um, there were a few people excited about the idea, but n- nobody was really willing to to uh, give a lot of time until mm-hmm. you know they had pictures and more details that they could you know build a story out of. Um, so that was going to be the second phase. We were going to have the, basically these packages be delivered to a lot of publishers in the New York area um, with Sriracha to go and with you know, bottles of Sriracha and um, details about the company, basically a press packet. Um, but what ended up happening was yeah. uh, after that initial launch, the, the initial phase of that launch, um, it kind of the, the product really picked up, and we we were getting more and more sales every day, and that's. Uh, when Farwood was saying we were having some 5 a.m. nights packing up these boxes and we were like, all right, that's enough. This is not sustainable. We, you know, we need to find a third party fulfillment center, people who can, um, you know, pack up these boxes and ship them out at scale uh, before we do this publisher outreach. Because if we do, if we do the publisher outreach and they pick it up, there's no way we're going to be able to, right. to, to fill all these orders. Um, turns out that the morning after, ironically enough, that we decided to not do the publisher outreach, BuzzFeed wrote about us. Mm. How did they hear about it? I think just just through Instagram or you know Facebook. You have a lot social. of great social media pictures with food and yeah you know, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that was a core that was a core part of the strategy, and um, I think I, the the two big ones I think were Reddit and uh, Instagram. Mm-hmm. And we would, you know, we we were thinking, what's the best way to get in front of people who like sriracha for free? So we had this sriracha to go Instagram account, and um, you know, we would we would stay up just liking pictures that were hashtag sriracha mm. because we figured, and we would comment and whatnot. We figured, hey, if somebody sees a, a Instagram account named sriracha to go like their picture, they're they're probably going to click it and see. Who that is? Right. And once they click it, they're going to see these pictures of Sriracha to go, and hopefully, you know, they reshare the image or they come to the website and, and make a purchase. Um, so there was a lot of that, uh, probably you know, thousands and thousands of likes on on Instagram. Um, and I think looking back, I think that was a, a really important part of the strategy. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a big, you know, could have could have led to that BuzzFeed article directly. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, you were going to say something. On that note, um, the, the Instagram note, a week before Halloween of last year, so, so we hadn't launched yet. Um, it's like almost a year ago. Almost a year ago, yeah. October, October 28th is our birthday. Yeah. So uh, a week prior, uh, Kyle and I and a couple friends, for the first time, uh, took the bottle, like, out and we're going to show it you know we were testing it and testing the cap and so forth yeah that, that i can see i was thinking about that i'm like that would be a nightmare if something's wrong with the cap like you have it in your pocket that yeah, would be an yeah, absolute- with, i mean they're, they're you know very 
very small percentage yeah. of people. It's very minimal. Um, the initial batch of products that we got, the cap was not nearly as strong as it is now since we changed our manufacturer, but we don't see that issue. But you know, even when we tested it um, for you know for a month or whatnot of using it. Uh, and taking it everywhere with us, uh, you know, we, we didn't really have issues with the cap. But the yeah. first time we took it out was that that weekend before Halloween, mm-hmm. uh, and we're just like, let's see if people notice it. Like we, we love this, and our friends love it. But right. let's see if like the general public, if they see it, if a bartender sees it, or a waitress, what wait- what people's reactions are. It was absurd. Uh, you know, that day I, I'll never forget. We went to Brooklyn, um, went to lunch. Uh, it was. Kyle, myself, we had a couple friends in town, and we were taking photos because we wanted photos for the website. And like, Kyle, I, I'm sure you remember this as clearly as I do, but we were at that. Uh, it was like a rooftop place in Brooklyn, and a girl spotted it, um, and she came over and she got all her friends, and then suddenly there was a circle of people. Um, she's taking pictures of it, uh, like asking us if we could, if she could have it, and you know, it hadn't launched yet, so we were kind of. Uh, I don't know. Like, do we do we give this to her? This is the first time we've had like any sort of right. you know real excitement outside of our friends and family around the product. Uh, and we said, sure, you can have it. And she actually posted a photo later that night. I, I just was searching Sriracha to go um, hashtag Sriracha to go on Instagram. Even though we hadn't launched the product, I was just kind of doing that on a daily basis. And right. her picture popped up. And um, I remember the excitement that Kyle and I had. Like we were, it was one photo, but we were so excited that somebody loved our product enough to post it. Yeah. You know, if you, I'm sure that photo is still there if you search hashtag Sriracha to go and go to the first photo, and I, it got like more double the likes of any of her other photos, and people were commenting on it, like, "Where'd you get this? How'd you find it?" So I think that triggered mm. something in mind that this Instagram thing could potentially be bigger than we we ever imagined it to be. Um, so that's why we did the whole liking everyone's photos who hashtag Sriracha because if you love Sriracha, you're going to you're gonna love our right, product. Right. Reddit, you know, we went on there and, um, and gave a coupon code and did a, a shameless plug for our product. Just, right. you know, Reddit usually doesn't like that, but they yeah. embraced it. The community embraced it and, and we saw purchases come in with that Reddit coupon code. And I mean, again, just the excitement of seeing that happen. Right. The first few orders were from friends and family. Once we saw those Reddit coupon codes come in, we're like, oh, wow, this is something that people outside of our immediate network yeah. might actually love. That's huge and very validating, too. Obviously, you spent a lot of time, energy, and money on this so far. As you want some people to get excited about it. Um, and I want you to talk about that initial, what happened with BuzzFeed. But first, talk about some of the infrastructure. You guys are smart. You put certain things. What did you use for software, shopping cart, platform, shipping out? You know what? What do you use for that to start? Yeah. So the the big decision in all of that was what do we use for our shopping cart, um, and what do, what do we want the website to look like? And um, that was a long process. And kind of going back to Farbun and I being very new at this, we didn't have any firsthand experience with with any shopping cart. Um, and so it was it was a lot of research and and you know looking at features versus versus features and uh, reviews of certain shopping carts and there's a lot of comparisons out there. And, right. um, we ended up choosing Shopify, which mm-hmm. um, we're very happy about. Yeah. Uh, what were you considering Shopify and what were, what Shop- were the other top contenders? Sh- Shopify, big... Um, big commerce. Big commerce, Volusion. Those are kind of the, the other mm-hmm. entry level uh, shopping carts out there that could get a lot of attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we did think about like a WooCommerce and... Um, uh, like a straight plug-in WooCommerce or something. Right. Yeah. But we decided against it. We wanted kind of a, an all-inclusive package that would do mm-hmm. the reporting and the, the customers and the orders and all that sort of stuff. And, yeah. Um, you know, Shopify's been doing very well. They add features extremely frequently. So uh, we're, we're really happy with that decision. Um, but yeah, it was very new to us, and then th- kind of the next step after that was okay. Let's let's pick a theme, and uh, Shopify has a great selection of themes that you can choose from, and, and plugins, and an entire app store. Um, mm-hmm. So a lot of what we wanted was was already there out of the box from Shopify. Yeah, yeah I'm um, but at we it. did. There was definitely some customization, and and uh, we found a friend that 
um, has done web development in the past and, and helped us out kind of getting the thing up and running. Yeah. So what pushed you over that as you go Shopify? Obviously, this is a huge decision. All your orders are going through this. Yeah, it's uh, I think it, a lot of it was those reviews. Um, I had read that, um, you know, Shopify customers were very happy. There were um, I think the scale, I think Shopify has more transactions than the mm. other two that we were looking at, which I think is a good testament to um, how successful they as a company are and how mm-hmm. successful their customers are. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just reading about the company and the kind of the launch of the company and what they've done and the, the founder, um, it was just a great story and I, I just felt felt like they were on a good path. and. Now they're they're a public company and uh, they've been doing they've been doing really well. Yeah, yeah. So what else do you far about do you think about with infrastructure? So you have Shopify, and I know you were talking about um, somewhere that handles the the shipments. Yeah. So you know, in terms of the shipments themselves, we were using um, Shippo or Go Shippo Shippo, um, yeah. um, which worked extremely well for us. When we were fulfilling these from the home, so yeah. Um, yeah, we were extremely happy with Shippo. They were extremely accommodating to us. Um, so you know, you can plug in the information information needed. It'll print out a label and and you stick it on and take it to the post office and you're good to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so that was obviously a huge part of our business for the first first few weeks. That we probably use that more than anything else because um, that you know we're getting X amount of shipments coming in a day. We're going to be printing labels for every single one of those manually, and, and they they had a good, a really good um, solution set into place for that. And, and I think Kyle and I both highly recommend Shippo for anyone who, who's in that situation. But obviously, fortunately for us, it, you know, we didn't need to use it for that long. But for anyone who's doing the fulfilling right. themselves, we, we recommend it. Yeah. So, what kind of tool software do you use today that is helps you run your business? Yeah, so uh, Shopify, of course, and uh, for email, we use MailChimp. Mm-hmm. Um, for for communication, we use um, so we use two tools. Kind of, we use uh, Slack. Yeah, and then we also use Asana, which is like a, a yeah project, manage, communi- project management communication tool, which is great. Um, we also use like a variety of analytics tools, Google Analytics. Um, there's a few others out there that we look at from time to time, and then um, Farbot and I do do quite a bit through Amazon as well. So we use their reporting tools, and mm-hmm. um, you know, at the moment, it's it's pretty fragmented um, as far as where what data lives where. Right. But we are depends on the platform. Yeah, we're uh, we're working on that. Yeah. So Buzzfeed, what happened? Uh, yeah. So. That was uh, that was November seventh, so uh, eight days, um, a little over a week after we launched. Uh, that morning, Kyle and I actually got coffee and walked to work together after just the, you know a couple hours of sleep, slightly delusional but like super excited about the whole thing, um, and but nothing had been written about us yet. Uh, yeah, it's only eight, it's only eight days, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there were a couple blogs potentially, but but nothing where not a lot of visibility. Um, and we were talking about what would be the point where we would actually, you know, we were just kind of in this state of euphoria, excitement, like this is actually something people love our product. But what point do we actually quit our jobs? Yeah. And, Fully focus on this and take it to the next level. You know, do, is it when we sell through our? If we can sell through all this inventory in three months, you know, if we have this inventory for a year, then we can manage it, um, and you know, we can try to grow it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, but we won't get in more than a few hours a day, maybe three, four hours a day outside of our other jobs. So we were thinking, you know, what is that threshold? And and it's funny, we went, we kind of went off. I went went my way. Kyle went into his office, and two hours later, I think. Kyle, I was in meetings all morning. I think Kyle was too. And my phone would buzz every time a Shopify order came in. And I noticed like my phone was just a constant buzz. So I turned it off. I thought something was going on with it. Um, and then when I turned my phone back on, Kyle had texted me with, have you seen 
have you seen our orders today? So I looked and we were, we were pretty much out of, we had sold out um, of all our inventory. So, oh my God. so we had to go on back. That's 20,000 bottles. Yeah. So that's crazy. Crazy. So, you know, we could see where all the traffic was coming from. Kyle pinpointed that it was from Buzzfeed. So we went on and we saw that Buzzfeed had written this article that I think within those first few hours had almost half a million views. Wow. Um, it ended up at, I think, right at about a million views within That's a couple crazy. of days. Um, so yeah, I was, I, I was, I'll never forget, I was sitting there and my, my boss was sitting right across from me, um, had a couple coworkers and uh, like I looked over at my boss, Russ, and I was like, Russ, I may need to leave early today. <laughs> Like, he's like, what's going on? He's like, I've never seen you look stressed or whatnot. And I was like, all right, I'm going to explain something to you. <laughs> so I told him the whole story, and thankfully he was, he was incredible about it. Um, but, yeah, it was one of those things where we really didn't know what the best thing to do was at that point because we just realized this had just completely changed our lives. That article had literally changed our lives, and we didn't know – how we were going to fulfill the orders. Right. So first thing we did is, you know, Kyle went on and um, changed the website to reflect 30 day back order. And then we actually changed it to 45 day back order. So anyone placed an order today, you're not going to get it for 45 days, um, which was kind of troublesome because we were, I think, you know, we were two months away, less than two, less than two months away from Christmas. So mm. people were, it's for Christmas. So our email suddenly went from getting three, four emails a day to, we had 200, 300 emails that morning in our email box wow. you know, saying, you know, am I going to get this for Christmas? You know, you guys, you weren't on back order 10 minutes ago. Now you are you ruined Christmas. And we were like upset because we didn't want to ruin anyone's Christmas. So we were, you know, we were scrambling to do everything we could to make it happen. And, and we ultimately did. But that day was, was absolutely insane in terms of, you know, trying to find out what we were going to do. And I'll, I'll let Kyle speak to what we ended up doing when we got home. But, um, just you know, we left. We left our jobs, went home, and I think we were home by noon or one, and 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 we're working towards that process of figuring it out. Yeah. So, Kyle, what what happens next? Yeah. So uh, that was probably that day was probably the closest I've ever been to a panic attack. Really? Uh, it was. You know, when we saw that. Um, it was excitement, like Farbod was saying, but at it's the a good same problem. time, was, yeah. I, I was, you know, I was really nervous. We didn't know how, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know how we're to fill, you know, going to fulfill the orders. Um, so, you know, it was a lot of anxiety around around what we're going to do. And so, what, you know, we we said thirty day back order and then forty five day back order. But the reality is, we were we were kind of just picking numbers out of the air. Like we didn't, we really didn't know how long. It was going to take, and we were we we kind of figured that that was an accurate number, but um, it's not like we already had a shipment on the way or any, anything like that. So, right. um, the the number one goal, and like Farbud was saying, what we didn't want to upset our customers. We wanted you know we wanted everyone to be happy. We wanted them to get their product. Um, so the number one goal from that point forward was fill these orders. You know, do whatever we can to fill these orders, and um, that's actually the day I was. Um, I was on the phone with my stepdad that evening, kind of explaining to him the situation and what's going on. Um, and he just happens to mention, hey, by the way, my cousin uh, works in manufacturing and he goes to China like four times a year. Like, should I introduce you to him? And I was like, yeah, where have you been this whole time with this, with this introduction? And so um, he ended up making that introduction and that's, that's now the family member that is, connects us to our, to our manufacturer. Mm. Uh, they, they, were, um, they were a savior. Like, you know, we could not have done it without them. We immediately sent them samples um, and said, uh, of the product that we had and said, can you replicate this? And, um, you know, they got the mold put together and everything. And, um, so from that, uh, from that point, we now had that underway. They were, you know, they were working to make the product yeah. that we would eventually send to the, to the customers who had already placed their order. So how uh, long did they say it was going to take? So we told them our deadline. We were like, we, you need like, 45 days. You're saying, yeah. And we, we needed had, that sooner. We needed them to ship to that, get them, get them, you know, and, and in line with this, we were, we were calling 
fulfillment centers too. Because you that, have to you have to send out twenty thousand bottles. I mean more. Yeah, it was we we sold through our twenty, but we had right. significantly more than that. So we actually we needed a fulfillment center not only because we didn't have space, but we didn't have the manpower. So right. now we not only needed new inventory, um, new goods, but we needed a fulfillment center as well. So we were we were managing trying to get both of those set up at the same time. Did you? And, and, at the time, so you go home and you have you sold out of your current inventory, which is like twenty thousand units, right? Yeah, how yeah. do you how do you ship all those out? Do you send them to a fulfillment center to send them out, or what do you do? At the time, we were we were packing boxes ourselves. You did all yeah. those? Oh my god! Yeah, so we had um, not not us ourselves. We were <laughs> uh, lucky enough to have friends. Um, very generous friends who came over and we bought them food and it, we have pictures of that day of our apartment. It's just kind of a disaster with people everywhere. It's like slave labor. You guys, you guys are not leaving until all these. <laughs> are our, girlfriends, our girlfriends were incredible. Like they were in it to win it with us. Like they were up super late with us every night. Maybe not as late, but they were. I mean, they were an integral part of of this and continue continue to be. But. Yeah, I mean, it was the girlfriends and then the friends. We have some amazing friends who came over and, and just were offering to help and seemed genuine, very genuine about wanting to help us. So so it was amazing. I mean, we, we have pictures, like Kyle said, of, of eight people like on, on the floor, on the couches, just packing boxes, taping stuff off, doing labels. It was, it was crazy. Wow. Incredible. It was crazy. So... so then, so you're in touch with the manufacturing. What uh, what happens then? What do they end up? Because uh, you're like, we need this now, type of thing. Yeah. So they ended up delivering. Um, really? Wow. And, that's yeah. Great. And there's always risk, right? When you're when you're in such a time crunch, like, what if anything goes wrong? Yeah. And you know, when you're importing a a product, there's always a chance that it gets held up in customs for a month or or six weeks and um, sometimes it's not because you did anything wrong it's just because it got held up um, so there were a lot of risks and we were you know we were really worried that we wouldn't be able to fill the orders in the time that we had committed to our customers but uh, we're, we're now happy to say that uh, the order or the, the shipment did come in on time everything went smoothly the product quality itself was great um, and it was exactly what we wanted and we were able to fulfill to fill every single order mm. by the time that we had guaranteed. Yeah, and the fulfillment center, Swan Fulfillment Center, was was great about working with us, and you know, they realized the urgency. We told them our story, and, and they made sure it happened. Um, you know, Kyle's family connection, the fact that he speaks Chinese and and is able to communicate the urgency. You know, right. we would never have been able to communicate what was going on right. to some China uh, on our own yeah. Google you know translating something through Google can only go so far so um, so having that I think was huge he was he was a big part of this as well um, and again it goes back to just tapping into your network you know we found the fulfillment center through our network we found um, you know obviously the, the family connection is, is an obvious one when you have family but um, you know this wasn't the, oh, most of this the reasons we made this happen was not because we just went on Google and searched something and, and found it. It was right. friends, personal friends, connections, personal connections. You know, friends and and family helping us actually pack boxes. You know, that, that's kind of the stuff you got to do in the beginning. Yeah. So, what happened after BuzzFeed? And now, in the back of your mind, you're thinking about your jobs. What happened about that? Yeah, I mean, the momentum continued. We were, you know, we did. Now we were. We kind of knew the situation we were in. We had a timetable as to when we were going to get our our uh, our shipment, so we could tell people this is going to be the date. There, they, you know, there came a, a cutoff where we had to tell people we were not going to get it for Christmas, um, which was unfortunate. We would have loved to have had the inventory. And looking back, obviously, we would have we would have purchased enough inventory. But we thought we could dictate what was going to happen, and to our surprise, and obviously. A great problem to have. Just got picked up. It's got picked up, but we didn't know that's what was going to happen. Obviously, right. moving forward with future products and so forth, we're going to make sure we're a step ahead with that. But um, you know, after BuzzFeed sales, people, everyone, everyone else picked it up. So mm. yeah, you know, L.A. Times to um, Esquire to 
Eater, you know, anyone you could think of mm -hmm. potentially would write about Sriracha, wrote about the product. Yeah. Ashley, Kutcher, Ashley Kutcher tweeted about it. Um, it. It was crazy. Those next couple of weeks were just crazy because the momentum just continued to build. Um, and and we just kept it going. You know, we, we, we had a few things we had to focus on. There was a backlog of hundreds of emails. So, you know, between Kyle, his girlfriend, myself, my girlfriend, uh, you know, close friend of in in um, in Northern California, we just had people who were helping us try to communicate with our customers. And as Kyle said earlier, that was the most important thing. Right, being candid and getting back to people as soon as possible. So we had the backlog of emails, um, and then from there, we were trying to respond to emails within 24 hours. So people, you know, people were ups some people were upset, some were thrilled. Yeah. Um, we were trying to do everything we could to make everyone happy. Right, um, and you know. When we got the product in, thankfully Swan turned it and got it out to the customers as within a couple days. And I'd say 99% of the people who were expecting to get their product before Christmas got it, 99.99%, oh. uh, which was great. You guys so, hustled for that one. Yeah, we hustled. And then, and then we had the, the serious conversation of you know, what are we going to do about our jobs? Right. Um, you know, the quarter had just... You know, December and end, end of the year. You know, started the new quarter, and I was like, "All right, what do we do? Is this you know, this is something that Sriracha to go is something that took off. Do we want to turn this into a business and keep the momentum going and build on it? Because if so, we're, we're only going to be able to do so much if we're doing it part time. Yeah. Um, so we were. I mean, we were. We both knew it was ultimately a no brainer, just because. We have how often do you get an opportunity like this mm -hmm. that goes viral and you, your name is out there and you could build on it. So I I ended up leaving in in early February. I think Kyle, you left a couple of weeks before me. Yeah, so it was like three four months time period. Yeah, it was. It, you know, initially what we had hoped for was you know hopefully we get to a point in twelve months we can we can leave our jobs. Uh, Kyle left in. Yeah, it was it was November or December. Yeah, three that, months. That's still probably tough, though, right? I mean, was it a tough decision? Because I could see, well, we're getting all this press. What happens when the press dies down? Sure, it's still yeah. a risk. It's still yeah. a huge risk. Um, I remember, were you not even thinking that? You're like, this is we're just going to keep this going. I mean, the only reason it took it, it was for me. I, I loved the news crowd. I loved the people I worked with. I was in a great a great opportunity there. So it was it was a tough decision in that sense, but. It was a no-brainer in the sense of this is once in a lifetime. Let's make a go of it. Let's make something happen here. Yeah. And I think Kyle felt the exact same way. So we were completely in line. Um, there were just a couple things I had going on at NewsCred, so I had to wait. Kyle was able to do it a few weeks earlier, and, mm -hmm. and you know, as of early February, we we're both 100 percent in. Yeah. So what does Ashton Kutcher tweet out? Yes, he just said yes with a picture of the bottle. Hmm. And awesome. so how does that, did you see, can you track, like, he has how many millions of Twitter followers? Yeah. Does that, do you see, like, a direct impact from that? Yeah, I mean, there's an impact. Um, at that time, it was kind of hard to tell if it was coming from his, tw his tweet or mm -hmm. if it was coming from the press. Um, overall, we've noticed Twitter is, you know, there wasn't a link to the product. Um, so, Ashton, if you're watching, maybe you can... <laughs> <laughs> That's another shout and link, Sriracha to go. No, it was uh, it was awesome, and and we saw definitely an, an increase, but it wasn't what you would think because Twitter is just, you know, people that go on Twitter see it, and they're not think, looking to buy something. They're not looking to buy as much as some other channels from from what we've seen, mm -hmm. and people on Twitter, you know, you have some people follow hundreds, thousands of people, so it's like. It's very easy to miss a tweet. You don't know what they're seeing, right? You don't know what they're seeing. Ashley Kutcher could have 70 million followers, but only a million of them might see the tweet right. or 500,000 of them because it's, you know, I follow 500 people on Twitter. So at any given time, right. if Kyle tweets, there's a high likelihood I'll miss it. Yeah. Um, but it was still impactful. It was still amazing. Uh, and, and it definitely drove some sales for us, but it wasn't like uh, anything to the extent of BuzzFeed. Yeah. So what was the next major milestone? You get on BuzzFeed, you get on all these other media outlets, Ashton Kutcher tweets you, you quit your jobs. 
Yeah. Was so the, the ne next major milestone, we had uh, <clears throat> Hoi Fong Foods, who is the uh, largest manufacturer of sriracha and probably the one that you're familiar with. The rooster. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The mm -hmm. rooster, the green cap. Yeah. Um, so they, they had reached out to us and invited us to enter into a, a licensing agreement with them so that we could use their actual artwork, the, the rooster itself. Um, on, what was on, on your original bottle? It was a dragon, right? Yep. Yeah, so it, it was a dragon and we weren't, um, you know, we had done that intentionally. Um, and, you know, since day one, we didn't want to compete with, with Hoi Fong. And that's, you know, the reason we launched the business was because we love Hoi Fong and we love their right. sauce and we love their product and we want to love more of it right. uh, everywhere we go. So um, we, we didn't want to be competitors of theirs in, in any way, shape, or form, and right. uh, we're glad that they saw it that way as well. Yeah. And they reached out to us and invited us into this licensing agreement to to really make it official um, and to have their artwork on the bottle. And um, hmm. that's you know, a huge was, deal. Yeah, I mean, for us, it was that was huge. And that's you know, actually going back to the to the piece about quitting jobs, um, that was one of the things that really made us feel much more comfortable to leave our jobs is because uh, at that point it became official. Like, you know, this is a licensed product, um, you know, that, that will be around for a while. Right. And so, um, so that was extremely exciting and, and they've been great to work with. And, um, you know, we've met with them a, a, a few times now and um, they've just been a great team. And, and as part of that process, they, they wanted to make sure that the product that we're delivering to, to customers is safe and, uh, BPA free and all that stuff. So there was a little bit of a, a product testing and due diligence right. process there, but because um, their reputation's on the line with that, exactly. Yeah, we're we're closely aligning ourselves with with their brand. Yeah. So how did they hear about you, and then how did they end up reaching out to you? I don't know how they how they heard about us. I think they're always kind of on the search uh, for because they're a huge company. Products. I mean, yeah. I mean, so they, I'm what's up? They they they. They're on top of it. Their their owner, David, he's always looking for stuff related to sriracha on mm -hmm. social. So after BuzzFeed wrote about us, he knew you know, people are hashtagging sriracha left and right. Even before that, people were hashtagging sriracha, and then it's hashtagging sriracha to go. So they, if he did his search, his due diligence, he would have seen it. And I think he probably he probably saw it. Well, like two days after we launched, because there were people, including ourselves. Who were hashtagging sriracha so i think they saw it then the buzzfeed article hit and i think it was right after that or right before the buzzfeed article that they initially reached out to us but mm -hmm. they're on top of it they they you know there are there are people there are companies out there that have tried to imitate their sauce and take the green cap and so forth and, and it doesn't even come close to the quality of their sauce so they need to be on top of that stuff and make sure yeah, yeah copycats you know, yeah copycats and, and they want you know if they have an opportunity for a good partnership uh, they're smart. They're gonna they're gonna take it, and they realize you know which ones are gonna be beneficial and which ones aren't. So they reached out to us cordially, um, you know, asking if we were open to it, and, and we were. When when it all got finalized, I mean, I remember after that conversation, after they sent us the signed agreement, it was like, I it was a sense of like Kyle said that solidified us, and that was probably more exciting than. The BuzzFeed article for for us. Oh yeah, it was just the sense of this is something real, and it's not something that's just potentially one article. Right. So, how did that conversation go for someone who may be in licensing conversations now or thinking about it? How did that that course go? Yeah, a, a lot of it was. Uh, so there was there's the legal part and then there's the business part and um, on the legal side of things, um, you know we had we had a lot of help from from friends, uh, one of which being Farbot's girlfriend happens to be uh, a lawyer and so we got a lot of advice and just you know we're running ideas by people and right. getting feedback and um, and then on the business end, you know we just the first call that we had with them, we wanted them to make sure that our intentions were good and. Um, you know everything that I had just said about us loving their sauce and their product and their their entire brand. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they knew that, and that you know we wanted to be 
um, we wanted to build a positive working relationship, and that was that was really important to them um, because you know, in a sense, like like you were saying, we you know we we are very much aligned with their brand, um, so so that's that's key for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it the the entire process took about uh, maybe eight weeks, six or eight weeks. Oh, very quick. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't too long. It wasn't too much legal back and forth. I mean, everything. Um, for the most part, everything that they had in their their template agreement was was fair, yeah. um, kind of your your standard licensing agreement. Um, there were just a few tweaks that we ended up making, and and that was about it. Um, so it was pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, they have you know they have some recommendations as well. So when they're licensing licensing their their name out, they. They want to give recommendations because it is in line with their brand, and we were completely open to all of that. Yeah. Um, because I mean, again, this product and the need for this product and our it came from our love for their sauce. Right. So if they had a recommendation, we were we were open to it, and we made a couple changes. Whether it was messaging on the website, messaging on the bottles, um, things like that. Like we, you know, we wanted to be a good partner because we knew this was something that was going to yeah. be yeah. Well to our success. And since then, it's been an, an amazing partnership. I don't know. I don't think we can speak to whether the fact whether or not this is how all licensing partnerships are. Right, but right. This one's this one's been amazing, and we're, we're so happy about it. So, in the back of your mind, when you start this company and you see these huge influx of orders, what's in the back of your mind about copycats or people copying you before the licensing deal? Obviously, now you have a licensing deal, and there's a huge differentiator there. But before that, were, were there any thoughts of that, or are you just not even worried about that because you're yeah. selling the product? You know the the bottle. The bottle. We we have a patent pending on the bottle, but there, there's still things that were concerning. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we thought if we could hit the market hard and hit it extremely hard and get out there first to market, you know, we can make a big enough dent where sriracha to go would be the name you think of when you think of a sriracha keychain bottle. Mm-hmm. That happened, and we were very fortunate and. Um, and you know that that's why you've got to when you when you do release a product that you even have those type of thoughts you have to you have to get out there and hit it as hard as you can right off the bat because if someone does copy it people will think of that as a as a copycat product and they don't they want the original and then like you said uh, Jeremy once we got the licensing agreement solidified like that's that's a big differentiator like having Huge. Yeah. having Fong as a partner, and, and people love that logo. People love that rooster. Um, I personally, if, if I went and saw the rooster and I saw a non-rooster keychain bottle um, at a lower price, I, I want the rooster. I want the real thing. So right. I think we're people are brand loyal to that product. Brand loyal, especially yeah. to, to Hoi Fong. Um, yeah, you know, we saw when we released the initial product, some some comments on that BuzzFeed article. The majority was yeah. how amazing it was, but some were like, "Where's you know." It's not the rooster. It's not the real rooster. It's There's not. one article I read. Yeah, it was um, by Eater, and it said an yeah. adorable un and they put unlicensed sriracha experience. I don't know they th- why they thought to put that word. Yeah, couldn't have left that out, huh? <laughs> That's a weird. I thought it was a weird word to use. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a positive article, but they they definitely put that in the title, right? That's stuff like that we now can avoid, right? I wouldn't. Why would they even think to put unlicensed sriracha? Experience that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's about food. I don't know. I thought I obviously specifically remember that because I thought it was a weird choice of words. Yeah, yeah. That was that was motivation for us to to yeah. finalize that licensing agreement with Hoi Fong and then and then go back to them and say, you know, look at us now. Maybe <laughs> someone from Hoi Fong called them and was like, "This is not a Hoi Fong product. You better put unlicensed in the title or something." Uh, Maybe maybe they reached out to Hoi Fong about it and something like that happened. Yeah. So what makes you? Why do you think that they reach out to you, right? Why would you think? Well, they're a huge company. These guys just started. We could just crush them and just make our own bottle. Why do you think they didn't do that? They focus on making the sauce. Yeah. That's the that's the answer. They have built. I mean, was there thing. anything in the back of your mind at this point? Like maybe they just want to know what we're doing and. Or created themselves. Yeah, but they didn't seem like those type of people. Yeah. They, you know, the conversations we had, they seem genuine. Yeah. Um, and we've done enough research on them where where we know that they just 
they've perfected the sauce. Yeah. They don't they care. Have, you think they don't even care about that? They're like, they just want to sell more sauce. David wants to sell the sauce and get the sauce. I mean, his focus is on getting the sauce in everyone's hands. Like, yeah. there's still a, a market. Um, you know, when we were in Dallas a couple of weeks ago, we, some people, you know, we were buying a bunch of sriracha. We were at, uh, I think we were at Walmart, and a couple of people were like, what is that sauce? It looks hot. It looks, that looks crazy. Like, people don't still, as popular as it is, and it's probably the most popular know. sauce and the most cult, you know, the largest contingency of a cult following of any sauce right now on the market. There's still a lot of room for growth, and I think Hoi Fong realizes that, and they want to focus on, on getting sriracha into every person's hands, you know, and, and leave the the goal of getting sriracha to go in every people, every person's hands to, to us. And you know, they they still got, which is a great sign, they because they're as large as they are and they're as widely known as they are. They still have room to grow, which is amazing, and they want to take advantage of that. Yeah. So you get the licensing deal, huge milestone. What's next? What What do you do next to grow? Uh, well, short, shortly afterward, we reached out uh, to Mark Cuban directly. Mm-hmm. Um, Farber and I had, had talked about it quite a bit. And um, uh, in, in Mark Cuban's book, How to Win a Business, it, he actually says, you know, my, my email address is publicly available. You could basically just Google it and, and you'll find it. It's pretty simple. And if, if you ever have anything that you want to share with me or tell me that you think I'll find interesting, uh, then just email me, and I'll I'll read it. I read all my I open and read all my emails. Um, I probably won't respond, but if I find it interesting, I'll I'll keep reading, and um, maybe I will respond. And so um, we had always thought, you know, when we get to a point where we really have something that that we think uh, Mark Cuban would be interested in, we should send him an email. And so it was a very uh, carefully crafted email that yeah. we uh, sent to Mark and. He replied in two hours. So, what do you send yeah. in the email? So we had uh, we had revenue numbers. We had uh, ba- it was basically our goals. We were saying, "Hey, here's here's what we're doing, and here's uh, here's what we want next." And yeah. it, a lot of it was around retail and yeah. um, you know retail distribution. And he he replied in two hours, and he said. He said, "You know, tell me more. What do what do I get, and what do you what do you need from me?" Was and the so goal up- to was the goal to get him as an investor for this email? I, you know, at first, it, we certainly um, structured the email in that way. It was almost like uh, a Shark Tank pitch uh, in the in the form of an email. Right. Uh, but you know. It, the question in the email was, "Are you, you know, are you interested in discussing further type of thing?" And his his response was yes. Um, so you know, when we reached out, we thought, in in far and I's minds, we we're like, "How great would that be to have Mark Cuban as an investor?" So it's it's certainly something that we were open to. We you know we weren't sure if he would be open to it. Right. Uh, so we reached out. He replied within two hours, and um, Farbot and I ended up staying all night that night. Um, Responding to him, literally, and we, I am you, writing an email. What's that? <laughs> literally until four a.m. writing an email just to make sure everything is perfect. Had it, you know. We, we we both come from sales background, so we've written a lot of prospecting and sales emails. But this was this was a different level. Could so be the most important one of your life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. So that included just uh, more detail in, in, in all areas, um, retail, what we're currently doing now on the website, the successes that we've had, how we imagine the, the product roadmap to develop over time and ideas that we have for the business. And, um, and I, I guess he liked it and he, in his response, he, about I think the next day, he replied and he said, you know, sounds good. He, he copied five or six people from his team got them involved and, and started helping us from that day forward, actually. Um, and then on the finance and, and legal side, we kicked off the due diligence process, which took two or three months, um, running through all the numbers and and getting the paperwork drawn up and red lines and whatnot. Um, yeah, but that they've been they've been a huge asset to us. Yeah. And every, you know, like I've said multiple times <clears throat> today, you know, this is Barbara and I's first time at this, so there's a lot. 
<clears throat> there's a lot that we don't know and there's a lot that we still don't know to this day and having them there somebody who's who's been through it so many times and um, you know has firsthand experience and a lot of the situations that Farbot and I are finding ourselves in uh, has been super helpful yeah you know so and I read I think it was in Inc there's an article uh, on this actually and it says you know talks about this what you know Mark Cuban invested in you for an undisclosed amount, so I'm sure you're not disclosing that. Um, but um, do you offer him uh, a percentage for a certain amount, or does he offer to you, you know, I am willing to make this investment at a certain percentage? We proposed it initially. You did? Okay. Um, and then it, that wasn't the number that it stuck, but, you know, there was a little bit of back and forth, and, and yeah. that was fairly painless because we came up with with a fair, fair offer, um, and his rebuttal was fair, and it, it all worked out in this case. And you know, we can't speak for the every scenario with him, but yeah. in our case, it worked out very well. And you know, we we later found out that actually this is this is a pretty rare occasion for for him to actually have a portfolio. Get company. a cold email and invest in something. <laughs> yeah, and then just like the majority of his companies right now, if you go to markcubancompanies.com. Um, are actually Shark Tank companies, so uh, it was you know extremely gra- like humbling and exciting for us to be able mm-hmm. to actually be one of the few. You know, we've gone and visited the team, uh, and we've got a great team under him at, at Mark Cuban Companies, and, and you know we've gone there twice. We actually want to try to get out there every couple months and just kind of have them be an extension of our team and really leverage their expertise as much as possible. Mm-hmm. So it's it's all worked out extremely well, and we're. You know, we couldn't be more excited. You know, we've loved Mark. I've been a fan of his. We're both basketball fans, and right. just kind of, you know, as, as his time with the Mavericks and how animated he is. You should have wore a Maverick sweatshirt instead of Golden State. My ties are always to the Bay Area when it comes to that. <laughs> but he, uh, you know, he's he's always so he's got so much pride in his in his team and most owners in sports, you know, they're not as involved um, as he is when, you know, it comes to going to every game. He goes to every game. He argues with refs. He's, he's like a fan. He's screaming. He's, you know, he's, he built a team that ended up winning a title who was awful before he got, you know, acquired the team. So, you know, there was that inspiration of like, hey, not only is he amazing on Shark Tank, but as a basketball owner, prior to that, we we loved him. So yeah. it's there's no one else in terms of who we dreamed of working with that I could say was ahead of Mark. So it, it, it was a dream come true in that yeah. sense. So what good advice have you gotten from him, whether it email, text, or, or phone? Um, keep selling. <laughs> that's 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 the one. He's a big sales guy, and he's you know he's always big on keep keep your focus on the on sales. Um, you know. He's he oh he's a big you know he's adamant on a company is nothing without its sales guys um, you know we 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 realize that we come from the sales world but we also realize products super important as well so we're you know mixed with that we're we're innovating and trying to come out with new products so it's having that balance of of selling and being on the front lines but also coming up with new products and mm-hmm. expanding our product line um, and then his team has just been. Uh, you know, around just strategic, you know, yeah. paying too much for something, whether it's accounting or fulfillment. And these are just examples I'm throwing out or uh, or potential new products um, that we actually have coming down the road that you'll hopefully be seeing in the next few months that we're very excited about. Uh, you know, they, they've been able to help us uh, a great deal with, with all of that stuff as well. Yeah. Yeah. So what's some good advice or direction that his team has given you specifically that sticks out the most? That maybe would have gone another direction if it weren't for them telling you something or sharing something. Um, a, lo- a lot of it, like Farbot said, is sales. So they've um, they've like introduced us to a program at Amazon called Amazon Exclusives, which which we were a part of for a while, and mm-hmm. which was great. Um, think things like that, that that happened so quickly that just weren't weren't really in the realm of possibilities, I guess, um, or at least that accessible to us um, had we not had that introduction. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things that they do are in the form of introductions. We have a, uh, Farbod mentioned a product that we have coming out 
one of which um, they introduced, introduced us to one of the facilities that is going to be integral to that uh, manufacturing supply chain. So um, things like that and being able to, to leverage that personal relationship and um, you know, anytime you throw out Mark Cuban's name in a conversation, it, it, it Take definitely, it seriously. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It buys you some credibility and that's, you know, that's helped too. Um, especially, you know, getting driving costs down and trying mm. to figure out, okay, how are we going to make this work? And, um, so that's, that's one example, simple introductions like that, that, that are very easy for them, um, yeah. make a huge impact to our business. Yeah. And you mentioned retail, right? I want to talk about some of the online channels you sell in and, and how that works. But tell me about your retail strategy because it sounds like that was one of the reasons why Mark Cuban you thought would be a great fit. Yeah, so we've, um, retail has been going super well for us and, and still to this day we think it's gonna be um, a huge part of the Sriracha to go business and, and uh, you know, if, if we continue retail distribution we think it will uh, become much larger than e than e-commerce. <clears throat> so where can people buy it? So people today, um, we're in Cost Plus World Market, so they have about 400 locations, I think mostly uh, on the West Coast. Uh, we will soon be in Urban Outfitters. Awesome. Uh, which will take that count to about a, a thousand locations across the U.S. And then we're in a few smaller, um, a smaller uh, regional chains like Pepper Palace. I think they have 15 or 20 locations across the U.S. Mm -hmm. there, like up to 30 or 40. And then, you know, there's there's a number of other ones, pretty large ones that were, were in were discussions there, with were in discussions. You know, we, we couldn't really go full steam ahead with retail until we had our, our manufacturing retail, in our retail packaging, um, uh. blister, which let me see if I. So our blister packs, I'll show you what it looks like here so you can get up. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is our retail option. So oh, you know, gotcha. you put it on a clip strip, um, and you know, we really couldn't go full steam ahead until we were able to show what we had ready for retail, which which is pretty recent for us. So yeah. like, Urban Outfitters will be carrying this, mm. um, and some retailers want to just have the the bottles, the mm. loose bottles outside of the packaging. Yeah, but we think this will will take it to another level, which is which is kind of why it's taken this long. Yeah. To be that's a whole new pro I mean, that's a whole huge project in itself. How do you manage and find someone and to get that design right on the packaging and to get the packaging in general? It took it. You're right. It's, it's a whole new project. Uh, it's almost like creating a new product um, because you have to have that the plastic shell that Farba just showed you on the front that's holding in the the bottles. That's a custom mold. Uh, specifically built for our product, all right. our product, and um, all the artwork, and just do you do one, do you do three, do you do two, do you have a lady on the cover or not? What I mean, all these exactly. decisions. Yeah, exactly. It's it's. I mean, it took time. We we found a, a retail packaging um, designer who's who's done these packages before, and we um, we worked with him to um, just as freelance on the project to do the the artwork on the front and the back. Um, and it was a, you know, it was back and forth. There were a few rounds of revisions because yeah. uh, we wanted to make sure to get it right. Um, but you're right; it's, you know, it's a, it's something that a lot of people underestimate because the reality is most people are going to buy it and they're going to throw that away within, right. you know, minutes of opening it. Right. Um, so a lot of times it's not what people think about, but um, right. it's definitely a big. Yeah, they can't just put like an empty bottle on the shelf at like a grocery store. They need they need it in something, and then you now have to create that as well. Right. And, yep. And you know, you can't underestimate the amount of time it takes to create something properly. So if you want to do it right, you know, whether it's a product or whether it's packaging, you know, that's something that we've learned and we learned early on, and we continue to learn. Like the packaging, we thought. We could get that up and running in a few weeks or a month yeah. or whatnot, you know. But if you want to do things right, it's it's going to take longer. The artwork, yeah. Yeah. the quality, you know, the, the quality control, and, testing, and so forth. Yeah, and it, one piece that we kind of s skipped over was deciding what we actually want the package to be, and that that was a catch twenty two because we were we were working with retailers, and retailers were telling us that they were excited, right. uh, and we were. We didn't know, did we want it to be a blister pack, which is what we ended up landing on? Did we want it to be 
um, you know, some other form of packaging like a box or, you know, there's a variety of them out there. And we, you know, we, we kind of ran through a variety of different options and there's a few different factors you have to consider, you know, first and foremost, what, what do the retailers want? Right. Uh, and that's how the they can display answer. it. But that exactly. Right. Do you want it to, to hang on the, on a hook or do you want it to stand on the, on its bottom, on a shelf? Um, and it's hard because it's a catch-22 because the, the retailer isn't going to tell you, okay, I'll buy you know a thousand cases if you do it this way. They can't really commit to that that far in advance. Right. Um, so we got a lot of feedback. We were just having a lot of conversations, and you know, finally at one point, Farber and I were like, all right, let's move forward on the blister pack. Right. If we want to change it down the road, we can, right. uh, but at least, you know, we need to have at least something that people can buy and and sell. Right. Right. Uh, so we decided to move forward with that, and and. Um, it's done really well, and then the, another entire entirely new challenge for us has been retail distribution. I was going to ask, yeah, the biggest challenge is with retail because there's no another set of yeah. learning curve, I guess you could say. Totally. I mean, buying even buying direct, which I think is you could sell directly to the retailer or you could sell through a distributor. Uh, both have their complications. Um, you know, selling direct, they. You know, the size of the box, the weight of the box, the thickness of the box, you know, dropping it on its corner, how far does it bend in, where do you put the stickers, it's, you know, it's, it, you almost need to be like a mathematician to like figure out, you know, every single step in the process and how to, how to package the product in a way that's right for that retailer. Um, that's something that we have never, re never really been exposed to. Uh, you didn't have to think about it up until then. Summer. Yeah. Right. But every every uh, retailer has their own process, their own distribution centers, and it needs to um, comply with their operating procedure. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like one. Yeah, go ahead, Farba. When you work with a distributor, you know the benefit is they have all this stuff perfected. They know what to do. You sell them the product, they handle the rest. But then you don't get direct contact with the retailer. So there's a middle person. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 yeah. So you know, you're you're ultimately waiting on that distributor. Get you the answers, and then you give them. You, know, you ask them something, and it might take. You know, it, it gets a little frustrating at, at times, but because you're used to acting quickly, acting quickly, and and you know, handling stuff. Our, you know, having our, you know, our destiny in our hands. Whereas now it's kind of in someone else's hands, which is the, the distributor in many ways. But you know, they really do alleviate a lot of the pain when it comes to the stuff Kyle was referring to. Right. Right. So. Then talk about the online strategy, because obviously that that part, you know, there's a lot that goes into the retail part of it. But I'm sure you guys have a, a wide online strategy too. Yeah, so a lot of it still to this day uh, is word of mouth and is organic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know every, every time Farber and I go out to a restaurant, we have our keychain with our sriracha to go sitting on the on the restaurant table. And more often than not, somebody makes a comment about it, like, oh my gosh, how cute is that type of thing. And so there's still a lot of that going on, um, which we think is probably the, the primary driver of growth for us. And the more we can encourage that, the better, um, which is why we're very active on social. We, we really want people yeah. posting their pictures of our product because um, it's, a, it's a great way to get out there. It's a great way um, to get new eyes on the product. So that that, I think, will always be... Um, what kind of our strategy is built around and then as the business has matured and grown um, you know we're trying to take a more scientific approach on the e-commerce side uh, yeah like tell me about what that do we want yeah. our, what do we want our marketing mix to be uh, between um, organic social growth digital advertising um, press coverage things like that I mean we're we're kind of working all channels right now and we've you know, we've been at it almost a year. Um, so, in a, a lot, lot has sense, happened in a year, guys. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're That's still crazy. we're still testing a lot of new things. Um, you know, we're we have a very open mind as far as what's going to work and what's not. So we're willing. You know, we're willing when it comes to Twitter advertising. Sure, let's give it a shot. Let's see what works. Um, if it doesn't work, we won't keep doing it. If it does, we will. Um, so that's kind of the the mentality we have a lot a lot of times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're very much. I mean, e-commerce is a huge part of the business, so we're very much yeah. uh, continuing to try to develop and 
and refine it. Yeah. So yeah. What, go ahead, Parvin. I'm sorry. When we launched, um, you know, again, we were new to this. So we were thinking, it's funny to even look back on, but we were thinking like Amazon, uh, they take they take a percent. Like, I don't know. We don't know if we want to go. You know, they take a nice little chunk from it's going to cut into a lot of margin. fees. Yeah. But like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if something clicked with us or someone told us that we're just crazy. I mean, you know, the reach, largest reach in the world is, is at your fingertips with Amazon and we're neglecting it. Yeah. Uh, Groupon goods, for example, some, some people Groupon doesn't work for some brands, but for us, I mean, Groupon has a huge reach. So we've been on Groupon goods a few times and it's done very well for us. So I yeah. think, you know, getting our product out. Um, without you know tarnishing the the integrity of the brand and so forth, where um, I can, you know without naming certain examples, there are some channels that we don't want to be involved in, but that's very rare. You know, like Groupon Goods, for example, is great and it's worked well. Amazon is obviously obviously the best and it's yeah. worked incredibly well. Where when we first launched, we were neglecting these these distribution channels. Yeah. Where now, you know, when we talk to people who are launching a new product, we we advise get on there as quickly as you can. Yeah. So what do you advise people, um, whether it's musts or mistakes, with navigating Amazon? Uh, well, I, I, so I would, I would recommend, I highly recommend Amazon FBA, f- Fulfillment by Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you, could, if you can find a way to build your supply chain so that uh, it eliminates a lot of the work that you personally have to do, I think that's that's the optimal way. Uh, but it takes time, um, so I think ba- basically what that means is trying to get the product to Amazon as as quickly and easily as possible. Yeah. Um, in leveraging, like Farbod was saying, leveraging their reach and their network um, is great. And Amazon Prime FBA gets you gets you more visibility within their their ranking system. Mm-hmm. Um, Something else that's also worked really well for us is um, Amazon Promotions, which is basically like you know an, an ad buying platform with an Amazon system, mm-hmm. um, so that you can target users based on what sh- what they're searching mm-hmm. for on Amazon. So, a very simple example is a lot of people go on Amazon and they search for sriracha. Well, we want to be there when somebody's searching for sriracha because if they're if they're buying from Amazon, they're likely buying sriracha in bulk. Yeah, and those are definitely the people that we want seeing our product. Right, right. That makes sense. You know, as this has been fantastic, I really appreciate your time. As I'm looking up, I'm like, I can talk for another three hours about this stuff, but um, I won't keep you on for that long. Um, so, what's next? What are you working on? What's keeping you up at night now that is top of mind that you're working on? Yeah, we have a lot of. A lot of the things that we've discussed today, um, that's that takes up a lot of our time. Like right. uh, you know, sales. We always need to spend time focusing on sales and getting more retail distribution and all those things we discussed. But um, at the same time, we want to we want to make sure to focus on on new products. Right. Um, and we, you know, a couple in particular we're extremely excited about. We think. Yeah. We think they're going to make a bigger splash. Those are confidential right now. I'm assuming they are. They okay. are confidential. But That's what I like about video. I can sense they're not going to answer that <laughs> question if I ask them. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but we think we think that they will make a bigger splash than Sriracha yeah. Vigo did initially. So yeah. um, that's something we're really excited about. So what products do you have now, just to give people a sense? Different sizes. I know you have yeah. different sizes. Uh, we have our. Our flagship Sriracha to Go, which is mm-hmm. 1.69 ounces. Mm-hmm. We have the mini Sriracha to Go, mm-hmm. one ounce, which is actually the the size that I carry around. With Do you me. have it with you? I, yeah, I mean always. It's yeah, it's that's the one ounce, um, and that is actually that minor change in size is, makes a big difference for like guys who want to put it in their pocket. The 1.69 ounce, I think, is perfect for if you have like baggier pants or if you've got a purse or a bag. Right. How do you decide on that, on those measurements? We, we tested a bunch of bottles and yeah. just came with what? Just put them in your pocket. Yeah, like tried on skinny jeans, threw them in, tried on baggy jeans. <laughs> 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 I 
Uh, like have spandex on, see what that was. Yeah. So I have, I have girlfriends test them, have parents, like it, we had a bunch of different sizes that, that we had molds of that we tried. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, we've got the bundles. So you can see on our website that we have four different bundles that you can purchase. Right, right. Every, starting from Sriracha for You, which is a nine ounce Sriracha, Hoi Fong Sriracha filled with sauce with a mini Sriracha to go and a regular yeah. Sriracha to go, all the way up to a bundle that has um, a, a handful of different bottles of Sriracha with, I believe, 50 of each. Um, product so many yeah. and regular. so if you're like having a wedding or something like that um, or throwing some sort of event you can get those at a at a, at a very good price yeah. um, and then we just recently started reselling uh, country archer beef jerky yeah I is, saw that yeah which is actually we released that a couple days ago and that's done incredibly well and it's actually very very good beef jerky so hmm. um, you know we have those where if you you know you can buy one or you can buy six at a discounted price. Hmm. So we've been working with them and we're reselling that. Uh, and I think we're going to continue to, to You guys could sell, probably sell more sauce than grocery stores, I would assume. Start selling more. Shipping sauce itself is expensive just because of the weight of the sauce. Yeah. Um, so that's why we bundle it and we can actually get, get the bundle down to a very good price for our customers. Where if you're just buy, selling one. It just 20, weighs too much. It weighs too much. And the shipping itself, you know, in that case, we don't, we don't want to sell a, a product where you can go to Walmart and buy it for half the price. Right, right. The price. Um, so, so that's what we have now. Um, and we have a couple products that will probably be launched in the next couple months. And then we also have um, some other stuff on the roadmap after right. that. And it's all going to be Sriracha related. Um, mm -hmm. And it's all extremely exciting. One in particular that we're extremely excited about. Mm -hmm. more so. you know, we're, we're hoping that Sriracha to go can be the stepping stone yeah. into much bigger things for the company. Yeah. So I know you can't talk about what the new products are, but what's your process for sitting down, the two of you, to hash out where you focus your energy and what the new product will be? We were. That's funny. We were actually talking about that yesterday, and I think I I think that that's one of the biggest challenges that that we face on a daily basis is what do we spend our time on because um, it's as, too much. Yeah, and and we could there. There's a variety of things that we could be doing, um, but what's what is the best use of our time? And um, you know, there are certain things that you know I'll, I'll do and I'll feel feel productive doing, but then I'll look back on and think, okay, that wasn't the best use of my time. And you know, a lot of times, product development and making new products and making things that have never existed before. It's a very difficult process, and yeah. it's discouraging, and it's tough, and people are gonna, you know, tell you it's not possible left and right, and it's not fun to do. Um, but things like that are is probably the most important way to spend our time today. So mm -hmm. um, it's it's a constant struggle making sure that we're allocating our time in the right areas, and it's something, you know, in our in our past careers we never really had to do. We kind of knew we knew what what our jobs were, and we knew. What what the responsibilities were mm. and what the steps to to success were. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, I think a lot of the product development actually yeah. comes. There, there's the brainstorming component of yeah. just let's let's think this through. Let's think this through every day, and, and that changes right every day. We're coming up with new stuff. I think the ones that stick are the ones that are more natural. Like, man, why doesn't like Sriracha go? Why doesn't this product exist? Um, and I think you know a couple of the products that we have coming are. are kind of fall into that line. All this brainstorming we, we do, um, you know, Kyle and I work remote, but we're always on Skype the entire time that we're working just so that yeah. we can bounce yeah. ideas off each other. Um, and I think the ones that are, are most compelling and we get most excited are about are the ones that are natural. Like I, I, I want, I want this product, not, Oh, I wonder if other people will want this. It's I want it. So I'm sure other people are going to want it. Mm -hmm. Cause I have one last question for you guys. This has been fantastic. What before I ask it, where should people go? Where should they check you out on uh, the website, social media? Yeah, sriracha to go dot com. S R I R A C H A. The number two go dot com. Social media: Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, everything. It's, it's sriracha to go. Easy to find. Post your photos. Check out the hashtag. Check out our profile. We have 
awesome, awesome person who runs our social media and marketing. So we have some some really cool photos that that pop up. So it's worth checking out. Yeah. And so since it's the Scubani Commerce Mastery Series, I always ask the lowest moment in the business, what that was, and how you pushed through, and then the proudest moment. Start with the lowest. Uh, I mean, I don't know if this is uh, lowest, but it, it it's certainly the most extreme, and we've kind of talked about it already. But that was the the morning of November seventh, um, and it. I don't know if it was lowest, but I don't know how exactly to describe it either. It's um, it was. You know, we were we were super nervous about what was about to happen, and it was kind of that make or break moment for us. And and you know, if if we couldn't find a way to fill the orders, then you know the company may have been over, um, and we may have kind of just had to had to wrap it up and give everyone's money back, and that was it. Yeah, November seventh, uh, when you basically sold out all your product and then had to go back orders. Right when yeah. when Buzzfeed wrote about us, that's, yeah, right. that's the same. And I think Kyle will, and I will have the answer, same answer for the highest and the lowest. The lowest, it's not. It wasn't a low, but there was that moment where we weren't sure we were going to be able to fulfill these orders, and the mm-hmm. thought of, you know, however many thousand people placing an order and having to go back to them and tell them, guys, we weren't we weren't ready. Like this product, yeah. you're not yeah. going to get it. We're sorry. And potentially close the doors. There, there was a split second, maybe a, a couple minutes, maybe like ten minutes, where I thought, "Man, this is it! Like, we have all these orders, but we're not going to be able to fulfill it." And that was a well. That was a, that was. Kyle said that was the first time he's probably been as close as he's been to having a panic attack. That was the most stressful moment of my life. Hmm. Uh, but it worked out, and we're so thrilled it did. So it, it went from the. the a split second of being the lowest to being a high. So it's the same for you. Yeah, same. Sorry, that's that's it's yeah. boring. But yeah, I, I feel feeling like the highest moments are going to be the same as well. <laughs> well, the, I guess the proudest moment came more when you actually realized what you needed to do to uh, fulfill on on those thousands of orders. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, to answer the question on, on the proudest moment and the, yeah. the highest of highs that we were in was actually. It's it's a split tie between Hoi Fong and and the Cuban agreement. Yeah, those were both surreal to get those within yeah. you know, six to twelve months of launching, and where we were twelve months ago today, and what we were able to to get solidified with Hoi Fong, which is the whole reason we released this product to Mark Cuban, which is someone that we both admire and idolize from a business yeah. sense. I mean, and, yeah, and another high. I'm just kind of thinking through it. You know, it's not. <clears throat> it's not like we're we're curing cancer with these sriracha to go bottles, um, but it is it is very rewarding to to make a product that people get a lot of enjoyment out of, right. um, and to see people on a daily basis post pictures, you know, and share it with their friends, and you know, things like that, and right. uh, it's really rewarding to kind of to kind of see that on a daily basis. For sure, you guys. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. And uh, everyone should check it out, use it, put it in your pocket. And uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you so much for having us. Try out for our, uh, our products in the next couple months. And thanks so much for the time. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Take care.